his changeup and slider is going to really get him through. Tejeda's made one start against the Tigers, and he won. That was three seasons ago when he was pitching for the Rangers. Still pitching out of the stretch, even with nobody on base. And at the knees to Curtis Granderson, who came in the game after starting on the bench last night. Ryan Rayburn began the game in center field. Granderson came on as a pinch runner. And then later the game was one for two with a double. One ball, one strike. Didn't mean to go around, one and two. Rain again earlier today, just like last night, but we start on time. 7-11 first pitch at 72 degrees. Time and temp brought to you by the parking spot. Easy to spot, easy to park. The parking spot at KCI. Tejeda opens the game with a strikeout. This is a good start for him, Ryan, to be able to come out right away and just use that changeup. That changeup is such a good pitch for him, and he's not afraid to throw it at any time. Tejeda struck out six and five and a third against the Angels on Friday. He only gave up one hit. Royals lost that game two to one. Angels getting two in the eighth against the Royals bullpen. And 0 and 1 on Placido Polanco. He had two hits, a run scored last night. He has driven in 10 runs against the Royals this year. Two. Tejeda came up as a starter. He's from the Phillies organization. Undrafted free agent in 98 out of the Dominican Republic. He was the Phillies minor league pitcher of the year in 05. Came over to the Royals from the Rangers last year, picked up on waivers. One and two. You know, hearing from Trey Hillman and Bob McClure, Robinson Tejeda is the kind of guy that coaches like to work with because he's open to new ideas, trying different pitches. And one of the first things that Tejeda did coming over from the Rangers last year was drop his arm angle down. That was suggested by Bob McClure. Betancourt, nice backhand, and throws out Polanco, two down. So just to give him a little more deception, a little more movement on his fastball, and as Mack talked about it last year, Tejeda only had to work on it a few times in the bullpen, and then he was game ready. But I think a lot of times, Ryan, when you have guys who know they have good arm, they know that they have they should be pitching a lot better than they are, and maybe the reason they moved around a little bit is because they were a little resistant to change. So now you reach some point where you say, well, maybe my way is not the best way anymore. I need to start listening, and it's really good that he found out now that if I do change some things, I can be a pretty effective pitcher to make late. Well, he's been ahead 0-1 on all three hitters. Carlos Guillen was a pinch hitter in the ninth inning against Joaquin Soria and struck out. Soria striking out the side in his last two saves. Six with the fastball, one and one. Well, if you've been following the Royals and following Robinson Tejeda, you know the stat that hurts him the most is walks. And when he is throwing strikes, he's not just getting by, he's doing very well. And when he's falling behind and giving up walks, his outings don't usually last very long. I think Bob McClure and Trey Hillman really monitors that too. When they bring him in in a relief and those balls start mounting up, and you know, there's one time he, he when he got maybe two guys and he was gone one time because he threw uh, eight straight balls. But but when he's on, I tell you what, if he continues to pitch like he's pitching right now, 
then that'll give the Royals something real positive to look forward to going into spring training. Well, his opponent's batting average is about as good as it gets. He's allowed a 176 opponent's batting average. He has struck out 62 in 48 innings. So the stuff is there. Yeah, that's closer stuff. <laughs> Over through that pitch, it's two and two. John Buck wants the change up with this 2 2 pitch. He has a strikeout with that pitch already tonight. And Guillen lays off at his 3 and 2. Guillen has spent some time on the disabled list, had some right shoulder problems back in early May. And he's been bothered by sore knees the last two years. Just a little high. So runner at first with two down, and we say hello to Joe Goldberg. Well, guys, we're talking about pitching and uh, surprise pitching story. Tony Pena Jr., who converted from uh, shortstop earlier this year, went to the minor leagues, went one and two with a 2.33 ERA in 10 games. He was here at Kauffman Stadium today throwing a bullpen for Trey Hillman and Bob McClure, and then going to go and pitch in the instructional league. And he says he's 75% sure this is what he wants to do, enjoyed it. Thinks things went very well. I asked him what he was throwing down there. He said a four seamer for effect, a sinker 90 to 93, slider, a split. Was just kind of messing around a little bit with that, bouncing it, but doesn't have a whole lot of command on that one. And I said, All right, well, is that it? And he said, No, no change yet. Also, I'm throwing the breaking ball at 65, 70. I said, Well, you didn't tell me about the breaking ball. I said, It's a, it's a slow curve, a sorry, a slow curve. But, Joel, I, I, I can't tell you everything. You're going to have to wait on that one. He did say uh, he thinks he's ready to face Billy Butler. He said he approach him with all fastballs and I'm already in his head guys <laughs> one and one on Miguel Cabrera hey, it's really amazing them, no matter what you do as a pitcher when you say I want to pitch and they, they, and they put the tag on you uh, as a relief pitcher the first thing they do is put you in a stretch and, and uh, you know you obviously have more velocity out of the wind up because you get more and more drive into your pitch but you know, just immediately right out of the stretch, and there we go. One and two to Cabrera. Well, it's against the Tigers when Tony Pena Jr. pitched. It was on July the 21st last year. The Royals lost that game 19 to four. So rather than use up the entire bullpen, Trey Hillman called on Tony Pena Jr., who just happened to be throwing. From a very low arm angle in the low 90s with a pretty good slider, he retired all three batters and struck out Yvonne Rodriguez. Two and two. Two hits, including a double for Miguel Cabrera last night. He also walked twice, both times intentional. Cabrera can beat you with power and he can beat you with finesse as he hits with a high average. He strikes out. Tejeda strikes out two. Tigers leave a runner at first.
moving into the rotation. And now talk about whether Tejeda will be in there competing for a spot next spring training. Going up against Justin Verlander. And this is what he's done in his last three starts against the Royals. He is 9-1 against KC. That's the most wins for him against any American League team. He is 2-0 against KC this year. With 19 strikeouts in 13 innings, he has given up three earned runs in 13 innings. De Jesus one out of four last night, so he's hit in nine straight. David has the most experience of all the Royals tonight against Verlander. He has 31 career at bats. And he's down, no balls, two strikes. But the one thing that Verlander said early in the year, this was back when Zach was really dominating on the mound, and he watched him pitch. And he said the one thing he took from Zach was being able to just go out and establish your fastball, not to be not be able to throw your fastball, pitch aggressively with your fastball, and that makes your other pitches better. Well, and he's got that kind of fastball where I guess if he wanted to and he had decent location, he could get by pretty much the whole game with just one pitch. Well, but I mean, you're right. He, he could possibly. I think what Zach found out in Seattle, and I think a lot of pitchers are starting to find this out, is that you can strike guys out once you get the two strikes, but if you try to strike them out before you get the two strikes, now you have your deep counts, your three ones, your two twos, and, and they want to go for that first pitch, put it in play early in the count, and then if the strikeouts happen to come, they just happen to come. Well, they have come for Justin Verlander. 222 strikeouts. That's the most in the American League. One ball, two strikes. Reaching back for a little extra there after jumping ahead of DeJesus. Verlander going for his 17th win, trying to become the first pitcher in the American League to win 17 this year. Still one ball, two strikes. Over in the National League, Adam Wainwright of the Cardinals has already won 17. And in the American League, Verlander sharing the league lead with CC Sabathia, who has 16 wins in his first year with the Yankees. David's still alive at one and two. Verlander was the American League Rookie of the Year in 2006, two years after he was drafted in the first round by the Tigers. In 07, his second year, he pitched a no-hitter. But he took a step backward last year as David pulls it to the right side and Placido Polanco, a Gold Glove winner, throws him out. And the rest of the Tigers' defense behind Verlander tonight as Ian Granderson and Thomas in the outfield. Inch, Santiago, Polanco, and Cabrera. With Gerald Laird behind the plate. Last year, Justin Verlander went 11 and 17. But there was a lot of good that came out of that season for him because he wasn't pitching with his best stuff. So he had to figure out how to pitch when he doesn't have his A game. And the Tigers believe that one of the reasons why he's having such a great year this year is because he's got his stuff back, plus he knows how to pitch. Yeah, his velocity, fastball velocity was down last year, and there, there was some concern with that. But but I think, I think it comes back when you utilize your breaking ball a lot more than your fastball, then it takes something away from your fastball. And I think this year he just said, okay, I'm going to go out and, and just use my fastball the way I should use it, then I'll let my slider and my curveball take over from there. Well, he's throwing a lot of fastballs in this inning. One and two to Mitch Meyer. Six foot five, 225 pounds. Justin Verlander, 26 years old. And the changeup strikes out Meyer, two down in the first inning. 
Well, he really comes at you real fast with that body, and that changeup comes out of there late. It's almost look like he's got the he's got a fastball coming out of that changeup slips out and just fades away from Mitch. You can just see how this ball just. I mean, that that is that's a changeup that runs like a two seamer. It's, it's hard and it's firm, and and it's got the right break. It's almost like that circle change. It's got the little circle with thumb and, 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 and index finger together. That's perfect. Now ball one to Billy Butler. Two more hits last night. Another double is 42nd. Drove into. And he's had a little trouble with Justin Verlander. This has been a good matchup for Billy. Now Billy, of course, is a good hitter, but he might have had a few guys gathered around him tonight trying to figure out why he has done so well, like hitting 435 with a couple of home runs. One ball, two strikes. Verlander's been one and two on each of the first three hitters. Right now he just seems committed to his fastball. We get to the two strikes, and now that's when he throws a slider to the to the left. He's down and in, and, and also his changeup is more effective. Verlander strikes out two, so give him 224 to lead the American League. Switch to the nation's fastest 3G network, AT&T, your world delivered. And by Colorado Tourism, plan your summer vacation at Colorado.com. So no score at the end of one. Aubrey Huff will lead off against Robinson Tejeda. Both pitchers striking out two in the first inning. Aubrey Huff was one for four last night, driving in a couple of runs. It was a come from behind win for the Royals. They were down five to two going into the bottom of the fifth inning. And then Ryan Rayburn missed playing a line drive from Josh Anderson in the bottom of the fifth. The Royals turned that into two runs. And then in the seventh inning, Cleet Thomas not making a catch in the right field corner on a foul ball allowed Billy Butler to have a longer at bat. Billy. Drove in a run to tie the game. Mike Jacobs with a base hit to put the Royals in front. Good change up on two and one. Remember that many changeups from Robinson to Hayda last year? Maybe even earlier this year, I don't remember that many changeups. I think he just came out and just tried to fire with the fastball and the slider, and it wasn't really until he got into those 
those two innings uh, and those three innings stints on hit out of relief. Well, he's got his third strikeout. So one away in the second inning. Well, we told you this was coming tonight. What is the best young fan face this year in our sprint, you call it? This fella, when he didn't get the foul ball, that's A. Then there's the carrot kid from the Angel series. This only gets better. That's B. Or then earlier this year, the Mark Tian fan. Her vocal cords are still healing. Text 432 432, enter keyword Royals, a space, A, B, C, or D. Your thoughts. <laughs> well, they're all very good. That's a three pitch strikeout for Tejeda. He's very good. Four strikeouts in an inning and two thirds. Now the Tour of Missouri cycling race is racing through Missouri in Fox Sports Kansas City. We'll have highlights and results tonight and every night on the race on the Tour of Missouri highlight show. That'll be tonight after Royals Live here on Fox Sports Kansas City. I think I'm going to go with the second kid, the one that lost the carrot, just because it's slow building. <laughs> Just when you think you've seen the best of it or the worst of it, depending on how you want to look at it, it just gets better or worse. Look at that pitch, 0-2 on inch. Here's the one I'm voting for. See the carrot, ah, disappointed, more disappointed. <laughs> Hand over the face. Just did both hands over the face. I've got to go for him too. I, I, just the facial expressions alone are priceless. <laughs> right off the chest of home plate umpire Marty Foster. They would say nobody knew but him what was going on. <laughs> well, the fact that he was so distraught over a carrot. As I said last night, that might have happened to me when I was a kid, but it would have been me spitting the carrot and just hoping that nobody else saw it. Brandon Inge 0 for 4 last night. Tejeda one strike away from striking out the side. He does with a fastball at 97. Tejeda has struck out five tonight.
certainly a place earlier in the season that you might not have expected a Mike Jacobs hit to fall because it just wasn't happening. But last night, a pair of hits for Jacobs, one to center field, one to left field. Over the last month, he is batting 280, and he's got 16 RBIs during that stretch, second on the team. During that stretch, he has 23 hits, guys, 13 of them either to center or left field, certainly making some changes in his approach at the plate, guys. And he hits one to left center field. It's a bit foggy, so Granderson didn't see it right away, but makes the catch to get Jacobs in one down. Once again, you call it, presented by Sprint, the best young fan face so far this year. The kid in the middle, that was pretty good too. <laughs> by the way, about a minute later, that kid had a big smile on his face. The carrot kid. Ball one on Alberto Cayasco and the Tian fan <laughs> with the veins popping out of her neck. Two balls, no strikes on Cayaspo. Alberto's hit an eight straight. Extended that hitting streak last night, going one for three. And he's ahead three balls, no strikes. 52% like the Carrot Kid. 41% the Mark Tian fan. So keep voting. 432, 432, enter keyword Royals of Space. And then A, B, or C. That is through the right side and passes sliding Polanco. Well, the Royals have their first base runner, and Alberto Cayaspo has a nine game hitting streak. He's really been uh, coming coming on strong Ryan lately just especially from the left side He's done a good job just getting the top hand over He's trying to get a lot of hits in that in that hole between first and second and he's just driving them all through there There's not he, they're not any weak hits at all Well the Royals have some decisions to make regarding 2009 with three hitters all are in the lineup tonight. Alberto Piasco, if he comes back, where does he play? There's been some talk about him possibly moving over to third base. If that's the case, what do you do with Mark Tian and Alex Gordon? Well, you could move one of them over to first base. Well, if that's the case, what do you do with Billy Butler? <laughs> well, they, you know, at that point, you're only looking at DH again. And that's something that Billy really doesn't want to do at this early age. Especially since he's made some strides at first base this year. He'd probably like to keep that going. So those are just all great uh, stories that the Royals are going to have to go into uh, spring training. Big question marks they're going to have to answer going into spring training. Jose Guillen is signed for another year. Does he play the outfield if he's healthy next season or is he DH? Piaspo is running and Tian fouls it away one and two. But you got Mitch Meyer. Mitch Meyer's really. The second chance around for him uh, after again got hurt, and now he's making the most of his opportunities, uh, not only uh, offensively but base running wise and on the defensive end also. So it, this this is when it gets to be fun. He and 0 for 4 last night. He's 0 for his last eight. And the debate will go on if Mark Tian is a Royal next year. Is Mark Tian best served? And does he serve the team best, moving around, playing different positions as he's done ever since his rookie year? His rookie year, he played third base every day. Since then, he's bounced around. Or you find a position for Mark Tian and just leave him there. Well, when Alex Gordon went down, uh, when he had his surgery and Mark played third base on a regular basis, it that's when his numbers started to come together. That's when he started to move up in average and RBI and, and the consistency of play, knowing that you're going to be in one spot all the time. So, and I'm always going to be a guy that thinks that the more guys you have in one spot, the better they're going to learn how to play, the faster they're going to learn how to play, and the more productive they're going to be. Now 
three and two on ten. But I really don't think if if, if Roy were bouncing David from left field to center field on a regular basis, I don't think you would have got the same play out of him in left field that you've gotten with him playing left field every single every single game. Diasco runs and Tian takes ball four. So he comes back from one and two. And the Royals have runners at first and second with one out. That's Verlander's first walk. Now Verlander doesn't walk many. It's only his 55th walk. The Tigers have had problems with walks this year. They have they are 12th in the American League in walks. But they also have a lot of strikeout pitchers who can then neutralize the walk with a strikeout. Neutralize the walk and also they, they got a chance to uh, to get that strikeout and, and get him out of there too. So it, it, the double play is always there for him. But when you can strike people out, I mean, they, <laughs> you can't ask. When you got strikeout pitchers, you got, that's just uh, one thing that manager Trey Hellman and Dayton talked about in, our, in the bullpen this year. Having those strong arms that can come out of the bullpen and, and strike guys out and get you off the field. Ninety-eight with that fastball, one and one to John Buck. Buck behind the plate for Robinson Tejeda on Friday, and Tejeda with five and a third scoreless innings. So Buck back there again tonight, and Tejeda has two scoreless innings so far tonight with five strikeouts. One ball, two strikes. Well, that fastball right there at 97 is going to be awful hard to hit. Uh, you got to make him get the ball down a little bit more. And uh, with 97 miles an hour, that, that fastball got a lot, lot more hop to it than, than a hitter would think. In his rookie year, Justin Verlander pitched his first major league shutout here at Kauffman Stadium. And he was still throwing 99 in the ninth inning. So, if you're thinking, go ahead and throw it as hard as you can now. He may not have that later in the game. Forget it. Uh, right, and you got you got two pitchers here, Ryan. Uh, Verlander, he gives you a lot of movement. He, he comes at you pretty hard. Where Tejeda's a little more smoother. And a little more laid back, and all of a sudden, boom, there's a 97 mile an hour fastball. Verlander, you feel like you're going to get a 97 mile an hour fastball the way he comes at you. Buck has Kayaspo at second, Tian at first. Got a breaking ball, and into right field, Cleet Thomas with Kayaspo tagging. And Alberto on his way to third, and the throw is cut out by Santiago. First and third, two down. Now, Clay Thomas gets behind this ball, Ryan, but didn't, but didn't really have any momentum coming through. So he was more or less through this ball from a flat foot and wasn't able to get as good a throw off the third base as he could have. You gotta get, if he gets behind this ball and, and comes through that ball right into his curl off, he can get a better throw off the third base than that. He yeah, wasn't that deep in right field. And now Alex Gordon, his first plate appearance since being recalled from AAA Omaha. This is supposed to be, or at least the Royals were hoping for, this to be a breakout season for Alex. But he was on the disabled list on April the 16th with the right hip injury, having surgery. And out for three months. One ball, one strike. And then a month after coming back from that, he was on his way to AAA Omaha, where he hit over 300 with a couple of home runs and 10 RBIs. Third ball, a little bit high, two and one. So Alex is playing in just his. 30th game at the big league level this year. Tiaspo at third, Tian at first. Two outs. Hey, 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 hey. 
two and two. I think Alex is in a in a pretty delicate situation when you when you look for players who don't get a lot of at bats, a lot of playing time. And your first thought would be, you know, don't take the year off. You maybe go to the construction league or go to winter ball and try to try to get those at bats. And and that that that's going to be the question in the year. What what does Alex Alex Gordon do? Three balls, two strikes. On one hand, I guess play like you just said. On the other hand, if that hip isn't feeling 100 percent. I mean, do you take the time and allow the hip to heal completely after the surgery? So he's 100 percent going into spring training. Well, I think that's the best uh, million dollar question, so to speak. You know what, what what's best for him at that point? Uh, as a player, you, you, you do need to get those at bats to keep the development going. And with 30 games, the 30 with 30 games right now at, at the big league level, and whatever he gets the rest of this is month, it's probably not going to be enough at bats to, to really, in my opinion, put him where he needs to be going in the spring training. I think I think if he's healthy, that he can go out and play, get another couple hundred at bats. I think that does a lot more good. So the base is loaded with two outs for Unieski Betancourt. You know, Frank, and I'll add to that that the Royals are trying to get Alex to work on some different mechanics with his stride. And he'd like to have, I would think, a lot more at bats, as you just suggested, with the new changes. So that's more second nature when he goes into spring training as opposed to he's still working on it. And that would be a good reason maybe to go to go to instruction league. You know, you go down there and you just do you don't you maybe don't play the game, but you definitely gotta get the at bats. You don't have to go out and play third base, but you can DH get your at bats, but at all at the same time try to fix some of the things that you need to fix. And I think the one thing that that, that I would like to see him do is, is get more of a direct stride to the target, which is a pitcher, and not stride so much to the plate and block himself off and then swing against his right side. And, and I think if he can free those hips up then I think he'll also increase his bat speed a lot more. Well, here's what Frank and I were talking about when we first came on the air. You're going to get an opportunity every game, even against Justin Verlander. Two walks and the base is loaded. And Betancourt and the Royals don't like that call. Unieski bending backward in frustration. It's one and two. Well, he's throwing that, that borderline fastball, and it looks like it's, it just got a little hopsy go up just a little bit. Larry did a good job receiving it, and he's going to get that pitch. And that's going to be a tough pitch to, to lay off of, and also a tough pitch to hit. Ninety-eight miles an hour. Diaspo singled with one out. Tian walked, and then with two outs, Alex walked. Now Betancourt hanging in there at one ball, two strikes. Laid off the high breaking ball. It's two and two. Verlander, by the way, has gone 19 consecutive innings here at Coffin Stadium without allowing a run. Strikes out Betancourt with a fastball at 99, and the Royals lead the bases loaded.
first two innings. Let's take a look at those again in tonight's RVs pitch by pitch. He's off to a great start. Here's it with his get Granderson as his first strikeout. Then he, he gets Cabrera on a check swing. Then Aubrey Huff, Cleet Thomas, and then he finishes it off with Brandon Edge. Tigers with one base runner. Carlos Guillen walked. But no hits so far. It'll be Gerald Laird followed by Ramon Santiago. And then for the second time Curtis Granderson. Laird 0 for 2. Last night and now 0 for his last 14. And he will bunt. There are many catchers that you can say that about. But Laird. And discussing this with him. Prior to the game. This goes back to his days in high school. This isn't something he has learned as a professional. That's always been part of his game. One and one. Tonight's Roadrunner Turbo Speed Pitch comparison, and this will be good. In the first two innings, Justin Verlander hit 99. I think that was his last pitch to Betancourt in the bottom of the second. To hit 97. You can double your speed with Roadrunner Turbo from Time Warner Cable. One and two on Gerald Laird. The guys do like to bunt Ryan, but when the guys throwing 97, 98 miles an hour, they don't want to stick their nose out over the plate and get caught out there. So uh, he may not want to try it with with the Ada tonight. Two and two. They're batting just 218. But he's also been the primary catcher for a pitching staff that has the second best ERA in the American League. And another changeup for a strikeout. That's six for Tejeda, and he struck out the last five. Well, he's throwing that change up anywhere from 84 to 87 miles an hour. And I, I tell you, uh, uh, Verlander's change up would turn over. But that one just really just more, more velocity, more arm speed, and Laird thinking it's a 97 mile an hour fastball. That was a classic example right there of a hitter putting a fastball swing on a change up. <laughs> I mean, can he look for it? Probably not. <laughs> And he comes back with a change up on Ramon Santiago. One and one. Santiago didn't start last night. Adam Everett was at shortstop, but Santiago did appear late in the game as a pinch hitter. In the eighth and flight out against Roman Cologne, who has back to back scoreless eighth innings in front of Joaquin Soria saves. And stroked into right center field, the first hit for the Tigers. So Santiago board with a one out single. Here's Joel Goldberg. Well, we've been telling you about the Royals minor league affiliates, three of them in the playoffs, and a nice start to. All three for the playoffs tonight. Northwest Arkansas in the Texas League out to a quick 6 nothing lead behind a Jeff Bianchi home run, the up-and-coming shortstop for the Royals. Wilmington in the Carolina League up 4-1 to one in that. And then Burlington on top of Kane County, 6-2. to two. They are the defending Midwest League champions and got into the playoffs this year as a wild card, guys. All right, thanks, Joel. Well... Burlington starting to win, but Wilmington has always won. This seems like they've always been in the playoffs. Haven't haven't done a good job getting getting to the, the the championship, but they've always been there in the playoffs in the end. It's a tough, a tough league, a good pitchers league, big ballparks, ball don't travel it well. But uh, I think it's a good prelude to going up the double right. Nice stop by Butler, and then threw it away. So he tried to force the throw. Trey Hillman's going to come out and argue. Don't know how good his angle was after he knocked the ball down. Well, this play right here, once once 
once he lost handle of the ball, he should have given up on the on the throw to second base, and then went ahead and just got the got the easy out at at first base. There you got it. Like you say, Ryan, the base runners could play a part in that. Santiago looks back to see that he did misplay the ball, so he runs on to the inside. He runs to the inside part of the bag, so it really takes Billy's angle to throwing the ball to Ben for the way. It's going to be ruled a fielder's choice, and that's it. No air charge to Billy Butler, at least not yet. So instead of a runner at second and two outs, Placido Polanco at the plate. With two on, one out. Polanco grounded out to short first time up. The Royals would take that here. Polanco, another one of those hitters that we've talked about. A line drive hitter hits the ball on the ground. Which means he is a double play candidate. And he's grounded into 14 this year. Brian Billy does a real good job getting this ball and stopping this ball. You look, watch Santiago how he looks back over his shoulder to see if Billy's caught the ball. And then he runs to the inside part and takes the base away. So Billy's angle to the second base is really just taken away by a smart base runner. Two balls, one strike. And those are some of the things that Billy, as he plays first base a little longer, he'll start to do instinctively. You know, once you knock a ball down, you don't catch it cleanly. Just always take the easy out, manage the game, take the out at first base there. You're trying to do a little too much, and you don't get anybody. And Billy is still thinking about that play. Three and one. With one out, Santiago singled, and the fielder's choice allowing Granderson to reach. Popped up. All the infield fly rule, so Polanco's out. Two down. The sixth and final t shirt Tuesday is September the 22nd when the Royals host the Boston Red Sox. And 20,000 fans will receive a gray short sleeve shirt saluting the Royals' 40th anniversary from Sprint. Get your tickets at 1 800 6 Royals, Royals.com. Coffin Stadium box office or area Hy-Vee food stores. And now Carlos Guillen, who walked in the first. He was ready for a fastball and was behind it at 96 miles an hour. 96 in on the hands up. That's going to be a tough one for Carlos Guillen to get to. Guillen has Santiago at second base, Granderson at first. Tejeda has already struck out six. One and one. An advantage that Tejeda has tonight, and we talked about this on Friday when he was really on a roll and nobody was reaching base, is that when someone does reach base, he doesn't have the adjustment of going back to the stretch position. He's pitching exclusively out of the stretch position. You see so often a guy pitching out of the windup for two or three innings because he's just knocking down the hitters. 
goes back to the stretch and is a bit uncomfortable. And Tejeda gets out of a little mess in the third inning. Tigers strand two. Kansas Committee for the Prevention of Child Abuse, helping to prevent child abuse and neglect in the state. She lives in Shawnee, Kansas, also a lifetime member of the Prevent Child Abuse America Board, and has served on numerous related committees. Tonight, she enjoys the game from the Buck O'Neill Legacy Seat. So no score, bottom of the third inning. Second time through for the Royals. David DeJesus grounded out to second base in the first inning. One and one. Royals with one hit against Verlander. But as we talked about earlier tonight, seems like every game there is an invitation given to you by the opponents is a matter of whether you show up or not and the Royals after a single and a couple of walks in the bottom of the second had the bases loaded but Verlander saved his best pitch for the night on a two and two pitch a Unieski Betancourt and got him with a fastball at 99 miles an hour. Well that's really one to finish it off right there that's probably being frustrated to had those two walks to begin with and and maybe just really wasn't aggressive enough and he just put a little bit more on that pitch. But we talked about that a lot about the perfect game. You're not going to have a perfect baseball game where each team is not going to give you an opportunity to score at some point. You know, whether it be with a mental mistake, a physical mistake, walks, whatever it might be, it's how you overcome those mistakes that determine whether you win and lose. And I think that's where uh, the good teams really get a little tougher is in, in situations like that, the base is loaded. They come up with the big strikeout. And the teams that don't do as well are teams that don't take advantage of those situations when they present it. De Jesus is 0 for 2. One out in the third inning. Tonight's league leaders brought to you by your Kansas City area Toyota dealers. And here is Justin Verlander's case for American League Cy Young this year. Leads the league in strikeouts, tied for first and wins with CC Sabathia and starts. And then fourth in innings pitched, fewest home runs allowed, complete games, and fifth in opponent's batting average. It's a good Tigers pitching staff, but Verlander is the main attraction. 0 oh 2 on Mitch Meyer, who struck out in the first inning.
pitches. Down goes Meyer, and Verlander has struck out four. It has not been a great year for the Tigers on offense, but they're in first place because of a couple of categories that really have survived the test of time. First of all, they have improved against the Central Division. They were horrible last year, 18 games below 500. But you don't think pitching and defense are still important? They were 12th last year in ERA. And coming into this series, they had improved to third. Last year, they had committed the 13th most errors. They've improved that, going up to the eighth most in the American League. So the offense is down, but when you have good pitching and defense, you've always got a chance. You're always in the ball game, I'll tell you that. And it's going to be a matter of, get, matter of getting a timely hit after that. But just having that opportunity to to win the game every night. That's what you that's what you hope for as a, as a player going on the field. Billy struck out on a change up in the first inning. A fastball that was up. Two and two. Billy getting his average up over 300 after his last two games. He had two home runs against the Angels on Monday. Two more hits last night. And he drills that one towards the corner. Fair ball. And Billy in standing with his 43rd double of the year. Location means a lot, Ryan. And this, this ball that Billy hits it, this pitch he hits it at 98 miles an hour, but you can see where it's at right down the middle of the plate. Verland has been getting that ball to the outer half and up a little bit and just running it right above the, the bat. But uh, we talked last night, Billy's ability to hit that ball down the line and keep the ball from slicing. I think that is phenomenal right there. The 98 mile an hour fastball, outer half, and he hits it down the line and just stays, <laughs> stays a straight line right down the line. 43 doubles. That makes him third in the league. Adam Lind of the Blue Jays has 45, and Brian Roberts of the Orioles has 49. Mike Jacobs out on a fly ball to center in the second inning, and that pitch got away from Verlander. Now Jacobs flied out to the center fielder, Curtis Granderson, but Granderson running over into left center to make the catch. So Jacobs continues to work the middle of the field and the opposite field. Joel telling us in the second inning how great an adjustment that has been. This pitch is pulled into right. Butler is going to be waved home, and the ball gets away from Laird. Jacobs down to second base. Royals take the lead. Jacobs drives in his 52nd. Uh, Jacobs hits his breaking ball and just pulls it in the in the hole between first and second. He just stays right on top of it, hips hands together, getting through the ball, then the hand rolled over. That uh, Jake's made a big adjustment there because he's been rolling those wrists right at the point of contact, and that's really hurt. Big Thomas comes up with a good throw. Uh, Dave Owen kind of gets caught in the middle. That's really what he wants to do right here, and and, and, and Billy just keeps going and. Uh, Fortunate that Laird didn't catch that ball. Billy might have been dead at the plate. And Jacobs on the throw moves to second base for Alberto Cayaspo, who singled his first time up. Got the call on the corner, 0 and 1. So Alberto is hitting nine straight. Two. So Verlander got to Jesus on a fly ball to shallow right, struck out Meyer. But no one, two, three inning with the Butler double and Jacobs getting him to the plate. Laird wants.
wants the pitch up and it was too high. You could see at the end of the signs there as he was showing the fingers as far as what pitch it was going to be and then with the thumbs up saying here's the pitch I want and I want it up. <laughs> Plus he, he really emphasizes it with the target getting that target up there. And they usually want to go when they go that high they want to go down low on the next pitch. Drilled to center Granderson shallow but runs it down. He's an excellent center fielder. Inning over however the Royals take the lead as Jacobs drives home Butler. Getting a run with two outs in the bottom of the third inning. And in front of Justin Verlander. Meanwhile, Robinson Tejeda has thrown three scoreless innings with six strikeouts. He'll get Miguel Cabrera, Aubrey Huff, and Cleet Thomas in the fourth. What the heck was that? Caught by Alberto Cayaspo. There are many sounds that a bat makes when it cracks. I can't say I've heard that one. That sounded like he hit that with a wiffle ball bat. <laughs> All right. That's when you go back to the bat rack and check all your bats. <laughs> that wasn't a crack. That was a clonk. I mean, it just broke right in half. <laughs> Aubrey Huff struck out his first time. Tejeda at one point tonight struck out five in a row. He got Cabrera. For the final out of the first, struck out the side in the second, and then began the third by striking out Laird. And Tejeda got on a nice roll on Friday against the Angels. At one point, he had retired 15 in a row. Two balls, one strike. Three and one. Ooh. 
Got underneath it. So Mark Tian coming up and right. Two up, two down in the fourth inning. This week, the NFL season begins with Fox NFL, a Sunday doubleheader. First, Brett Favre makes his Vikings debut as Minnesota takes on Cleveland. Then the Redskins take on the Giants in a showdown between NFC East rivals. Coverage begins Sunday with America's number one pregame show at 11 a.m. Central. Lee Thomas also struck out his first time. Thomas is 0 for his last eight. One ball, one strike. Going back to Tejeda's past few outings in the bullpen, he has now gone. 16 and two thirds scoreless innings. And 16 and two thirds. Allowing. Only three hits. Well he's got a good mix of pitches now and he, he's got he can speed you up and he can slow you down but when he drives that fastball to the bottom of the zone. He's awful tough to hit. Still one and two on Thomas. That fan was booed because up oh, that'll be in tomorrow's you call it but we're not on TV tomorrow <laughs> over Betancourt's glove and that's deep into left center field so plays perfectly Thomas ends up with a double and the reason that would be a part of you call it presented by Sprint we've been asking you about the best young fan face this year. This was last night. The kid in the middle didn't get the ball. And distraught, burying his face in his arms. And there was the carrot kid. That's what you get for pounding your fist up against your cheek. <laughs> Covering his face with one hand, then two hands. And then the exact opposite is the Tian fan that was earlier this year. Yeah, I would have a migraine after that. <laughs> Well, the last kid, <laughs> and this kid here tried to catch this ball, Ryan, but it caught him right in the belly. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so that, that wasn't necessarily because the grown-up took the ball from him. He took a no. shot off the gut. <laughs> yeah, he, he took that one full ball right in the right in the, right in the stomach. Now he has the baseball and all is right in the world. <laughs> he might even get a milkshake out of it. <laughs> Inge having a tough time with Tejeda's fastball tonight. You see, I say he drives that fastball right down in there, and I, I ask downhill. What, that's what Bob McClure talks about, downhill playing. And when he drives that 96 mile an hour fastball down like that, it, it's hard to catch up with. You got to have a short, quick stroke to get there. Or you got to start yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Out of play. Wow. Is everyone all right downstairs? There was quite a scream down below us. Well, I hope it wasn't that guy that was screaming. In strikes out again. That's seven for Tejeda and now 18 consecutive scoreless innings.
American packages benefiting the American Heart Association. IV Macy's and 38th the spot are teaming up for the night to bring you food, fashion, and fun. Plus, the first 10,000 ladies receive a free royal shirt from hy -Vee. You can purchase VIP ticket packages and register to win a makeover at royals.com slash girls night out. Mike Jacobs driving in Billy Butler in the third inning. 0-2 on Mark Tian. On base with a walk in the second. Backhand has to hurry and just gets Tian. Verlander walked two in the second inning, and the Royals loaded the bases against him. But he was able to strike out Yinieski Betancourt. And then with two outs and nobody on in the third, that's when the Royals scored their run. Billy Butler doubled, and Mike Jacobs followed with the single. John Buck out in a fly ball to right in the second inning. One and one. The Tigers have really drafted well in regard to pitchers in this decade. Verlander, first round pick in 2004. In 2006, they got Andrew Miller, whom they traded to the Florida Marlins, and that helped get Miguel Cabrera here. 2007, Rick Porcello. We saw him last night. In 2008, we saw Ryan Perry last night. Through the left side, John Buck with a one out single. John just got a pitch down and in. That's probably where he's most successful at right there, Ryan, is that down and in area. He's got a pitch in his zone and able to get it in out in the, out in the left field. You know, a lot of those, all those pitches that you named, uh, they're, they're prototypical type pitches too. All tall, all throw mid 90s and above. So they seem to have an idea of what type, what body type of a pitcher that they want. Also, I remember Bonderman being number one for the A's. They traded and got him over there, and he's a he's a big guy also, and they all they all have power arms. Well, if you do the math, Justin Verlander is the result of the Tigers' 119 loss season. That was in 2003. So the next draft pick was 2004. In some cases, the Tigers taking a pitcher that other teams passed on because of the pitcher's agent and some big demands. In 06, the Royals were taking a long look at Andrew Miller and decided on Luke Kochaver. Rick Porcello in 07 would have gone a lot higher, but his price tag was enormous, so he dropped down to 27, and the Tigers were willing to shell out the money. Gordon out on a pop out to third, two down. Hard to believe that six years ago, the Detroit Tigers were challenging the worst record in Major League history. Ended up with 119 losses, one shy of the Mets who lost 120 in what 1962 I believe boy that is ancient history now was 1962 was that under Casey Stengel I think so 
I remember that 119. I remember Alan Trammell was a manager, and I, I tell you, really, you really, could, you really felt for him because they, they just didn't have much of a chance. And I think nobody wanted to see him lose 120 games. So it was nice that he, he didn't get that record, but at the same time, they did get some valuable draft choices and and took took advantage of it. Three years after that season, they were in the World Series. One and one, and now the Tigers have one of the highest payrolls in the American League. Fans are coming out to Comerica Park, trading for some of the more elite players in the game, giving big dollar contracts to free agents. So they reap the benefits of that 119 loss season and no longer have to go dragging the lake to find players. You got Jim Leland to come out of retirement in 2006. And that same year, Tigers were in the World Series losing to the Cardinals. Court struck out on a fastball at 99 miles an hour with the bases loaded in the second inning. Tried to get him with a change up this time and it's two and two. Well, Verlander normally goes deep into games and he's fifth in the league in innings pitch. At least that's where he was when the game began. But the Royals are working him over. And this next pitch will be his 80th. So he's at about 20 pitches per inning. And that might mean the Royals get into that Tiger bullpen early. Off the fist, Santiago, nice play to keep it from going into the outfield. But John Buck is safe at second base. So an infield single for Metcourt. Well, he's got in on his hand. The Santiago got a good jump on his ball, and, and Polanco did everything he could, stretched out like a first baseman, try to try to help him as much as he could. But to be able to stop this ball and make this play, uh, that, that was pretty. That was pretty nice play right there. Now, right, getting back to Verlander, in three of his last five outings, he's gone 120 pitches or more. He's gone 120, 125, and 126. Two on two out for DeJesus and David off the end of the bat, but into the corner, a long run for Thomas. Just foul. Didn't hit it hard. He hit it high, but in a good spot. Thomas was more towards right center field. Two baseball lengths the foul line to where that ball landed. David is grounded out to second base, fly to right, so he's pulled the ball both times against Verlander. Seven base runners against Verlander in the first four innings. And with Verlander pitching a 1 2 3 first, really that's seven base runners in the last three innings. Got the call. Well, he missed his location, but he got a good favorable call. This ball had a good run to it. I think the one thing that helps us him is Jerry Laird. He does an outstanding job catching these low balls. He makes them look like they're strikes. He tries not to let his, his, his glove drop down below where he catches the ball. And, and the umpire sees the top of that glove and it appears to be knee high. 
And Verlander strikes him out, and the Royals end up stranding two, but have a one to nothing lead. He's not only just matching Justin Verlander, he's the one pitching with the lead. Well, he really is, Ryan. They're, they're really filling the stadium up with some heat tonight. You know, 90, 99, 97 from both pitchers, and the strikeouts are coming up. And the Royals have really had some good opportunities to score and they haven't, and only got through one time. But uh, the key thing now is they're giving themselves opportunities. And, and Wade Tejada's throwing the ball tonight. Trey Hillman and Bob McClure's got to feel pretty good. Well, you can do it once. And Tejeda as a fill in on Friday pitched very well against the Angels, but can he do it again? And so far, so good. Tejeda with nine and a third scoreless innings and his two starts combined, surrendering a total of three hits. It'll be Gerald Laird, followed by Ramon Santiago and Curtis Granderson in the fifth. Laird snapping his head up, but he might remember that he just got a very good call from the same umpire, Marty Foster, when DeJesus was batting in the fourth. So he's probably not going to argue too much on a pitch like that because he wants that same pitch. Laird struck out in the third inning. Tejeda with seven already, including five in a row at one point. And Gerald Laird is now 0 for his last 15. Just over our heads. And back down to the lower level. And into the hands of a young fan who's going to have to figure out the rest of the game what he's going to do with that ball. My favorite from time to time if you get a kid up against the railing and of course anytime a kid has a ball in their hand their parents are always encouraging them throw the ball throw the ball and they'll get a souvenir ball in their hand what are they going to do they're going to throw it throw out the ball throw it back on the field <laughs> <laughs> didn't get that call it's three and two to hate his pitch count brought to you by James B Nutter and company right at 70. A little less than a two to one strike to ball ratio, but that hasn't hurt Tejeda, who has walked only one, and that was way back in the first. He has seven strikeouts. Still three and two.
Well, apparently taking the ball away from a young fan is the equivalent of taking the ball away from a lady. Especially if the lady's hustling. <laughs> and if the lady has two kids at the ballpark. To hate a second walk. And the first time the Tigers have had a leadoff man on. This Saturday, two Big 12 football teams from our Royals viewing area will play on pay-per-view. Nebraska plays Arkansas State, and Missouri takes on Bowling Green. You can access your digital program guide or call your local cable, satellite, or fiber optic provider to order. So Tejeda lets a struggling hitter get away, and Gerald Laird. And now we'll keep an eye on Ramon Santiago, who's a hit and run candidate, also an excellent bunner. He's single to center in the third inning. Showing bunt and taking ball one. Is running and Santiago into center field. Laird reads it and gets back to second base. Royals tried to use a decoy play to convince Laird that that ball was hit on the ground, but he wouldn't go for it. That's one of the reasons you have to look in when you when you run it on the hit and run. You have to look in to see what to do. It happened with the ball. Santiago really wants to try to hit this ball hard on the ground, but yeah, but they end up hitting a line drive. So it's hard to dig a guy if he looks in, but if you don't look in, they get you almost every time. Curtis Granderson is struck out and grounded into a fielder's choice. Oh. Left side of the infield. And Betancourt calling off Gordon. Two down. So Laird with the leadoff walk, still standing at first base. And up comes Placido Polanco. Polanco is grounded out to short. He's popped to short. Tejeda working on his 18th consecutive scoreless inning, going back to his last few outings in the bullpen before his start on Friday against the Angels. A little high ball one. Zach talking catching with Brian Pena. Well, it's just nice to see him smiling and having a good time. I He's probably telling him, I, I, I could catch. If you, if, you let me, if you let me do it, I could do it. I'm, I'm that athletic. I can get it done. <laughs> Zach's pretty tight-lipped when you ask him who he would compare himself to as far as other pitchers in the American League. But he has admitted that a couple of guys that he really likes to watch are Justin Verlander and Felix Hernandez. One and one on Polanco. Brian making sure that Zach didn't mess up his glove while he was wearing it. <laughs> nice pitch down and away. That's about all Polanco could do with that one and two. Yeah, when he's down there, he, he's pretty hard to hit. That ball's getting it gets heavy. The more down he has to it, the heavier it gets. And, and when he gets to the outer half, then he's pretty tough. I'm sure he wishes he had that pitch back to Laird earlier. That, that was a pitch that he would probably, that's the zone he'd probably like to hit more than one time.
still one and two. Polanco, one of the most difficult in the American League to strike out. He was the most difficult in 2007 and 2008. And now tied with Alberto Cayaspo as the most difficult this year. Both he and Cayaspo striking about a once every 16 at bats. And he really chokes up with two strikes. Give him a shorter swing, more bat control. Laird runs again, and Polanco takes just outside. So much so that John Buck didn't even bother about Gerald Laird. He thought that was strike three. I think he's just concentrating on this pitch. This ball came back and he hit the glove. Oh, Polanco's got a good eye and he laid off of it. I don't think he's done much of this pitch anyway, right? It might have been off the plate just by a little bit. So two and two on Polanco. Right center field. Mitch Meyer is there. And that is 18 consecutive scoreless innings for Robinson Tejeda. Royals baseball brought to you tonight by Panera Bread. Explore a menu full of soup, salad, sandwiches, and savory breakfast items. Panera Bread, where every detail matters. And the state of Missouri tobacco quit line. Call 1-800-QUIT-NOW. The illuminated Royals Hall of Fame out in left field. That's from the concourse side. And inside Coffin Stadium, it's one to nothing Royals. Mike Jacobs driving in Billy Butler in the third inning. And that's the only run is Mitch Meyer, who struck out in his first two plate appearances, goes the other way on Verlander. That's the sixth hit for the Royals. And their eighth base runner in the last three plus innings. One thing you notice about Mitch Ryan, balls down and in, he pulled, balls up around the waist. He seems to be able to go to the left field with that pitch. And this, this is a running fastball away from him, up, and he got a base hit to left field. With two outs, nobody on in the third inning. Billy Butler doubled into the right field corner and then scored on the Mike Jacobs single. Billy is 11 out of 25 against Justin Verlander. Fastball hit the inside. So Billy hitting at 302, but at Kauffman Stadium, he's hitting 350. And this ballpark is perfect for his swing. Don't know how many home runs he's going to hit, but I don't think if he stays healthy, this will be his only 40 double year. 
<laughs> I don't think so either, Ryan. Not, not the way he moves the ball around. And he bends a curveball in for a strike. Back on July the 7th, Billy took Verlander deep in Detroit. That's one of two career home runs for Billy against Verlander. He had a double in that same game. And pounds the breaking ball past the mound. Inge coming in and still gets the out. A little faster runner, and that's trouble for the Tigers. That's big trouble. He ends it an outstanding job coming across and, and getting this ball on the first grab. That, that's the toughest part about the bare hand is that you got to get the ball in a good part of your hand where you can throw right away, and Inge did that. It was a breaking ball that Billy got a late swing on, and he came across and made a nice, nice catch and throw. It took him. 13 steps to catch the ball and one more step to throw. 14 <laughs> steps to make that play. Last year, Brandon Inch, who moved around quite a bit for the Tigers, committed one error all year. So Mike Jacobs, we'll see if he gets a breaking ball in this at bat because that's what he pulled through the right side, driving in Billy Butler in the third inning. Fifty two driven in for Jacobs. He's hit in six straight. Hard stuff inside. It's one and one. Mike Jacobs is four out of eight against Justin Verlander. Into the Tiger dugout. Coming up on Monday, September the 21st, it's halfway to St. Patty's Day, sponsored by KC Irish Fest. You'll enjoy a free concert by the elders, browse booths of Gaelic vendors, and taste some traditional Irish food. All in the outfield experience before the Royals Red Sox at 710. Special ticket packages include a Kelly Green Royals cap. Again, pounding him inside. Two and two. So Justin Verlander, if he can prevent it, is not going to hang a breaking ball out over the middle of the plate. And a fastball that was up and away strikes him out. So six for Verlander. And Meyer at second base for Alberto Cayaspo. He's given up one run, but it's been a grind. 29 pitches in the second. Nearly 20 in the third and right at 20 in the fourth. So he's closing in on 100 and we're only in the fifth inning. Iaspo has singled and flied out. Royals have two hitters that have hit in nine straight games. De Jesus carrying a nine game hitting streak into the game tonight. He's hitless so far. And Kayaspo extending his hitting streak to nine games tonight. One and one. What a difference between Verland and Zach is Verlander throws hard everything except for his changeup, curveball, slider, and, and his fastball. Where Zach can throw go to that 68 mile an hour curveball and really slow the hitter down because hitters have a hard time slowing down. They can speed up to hit that 98 mile an hour fastball, but they have a hard time slowing down, uh, especially when you go from 97 all the way in the, into the 60s. 
That crossed up Laird and nearly got through his legs. Meyer opened the inning with a single. Went to second on Butler's ground out. Still standing there after Jacob's strikeout. Three and one. Ninety eight pitches for Verlander. And his third walk. So two on, two out, and once again, here's Joel. Well, you'll see Alberto Cayaspo walking down the first base, and he knows the guy over there pretty well. Cayaspo born April 19th, 1983. Cabrera, April 18th, 1983. Both in Maracay, Venezuela. I was talking to Alberto about it. He said they were winter league, uh, winter ball teammates a couple of years ago where Alberto actually played center field and Cabrera played third base and DH and he said they were actually summer league teammates one year during high school I asked Cabrera about those early years and he said well like everybody else in Venezuela we all wanted to be Louis Aparicio and Davy Concepcion and Omar Vizquel so we were both shortstops but he couldn't play because I was better than him so I ended up playing shortstop and he wasn't good enough I reminded him that neither one made it to the big leagues as a shortstop and he said nope now I'm a first baseman now I want to be Andres Galarraga guys <laughs> the big cat <laughs> so Mark Tien with two on. Tien has walked and grounded out. And Verlander still throwing 97. That was the one thing about Caspo and talking to White Sox manager guys again. He said in winter ball, Caspo plays a lot of left field. Uh, so so that wouldn't be a foreign position to him if, if the Royals were to come back and look at him as being uh, maybe a super utility guy next year, second, third, and possibly left field. One and one. Well, those two were born around the same time, but a huge difference in the big leagues is that Kiaspo is really just getting his big league career going. Cabrera has been around for a while. He got to the big leagues as a 20 year old in 2003 when the Florida Marlins. Beat the Yankees in the World Series. And playing a position he had never played before as a professional. The only spot that they had for Cabrera, they wanted his bat, was right field. One and two on Tian. You don't hear a whole lot about Cabrera nationally playing for the Marlins, even though he was a world champion as a rookie. And the Tigers, either one of those teams, really high profile teams. But Miguel Cabrera is the third fastest of 500 RBIs in baseball history. So he's made quite a mark in a very short period of time. Still one and two to Tian. Yeah, a lot of it kind of goes back to where you play, also. If he was playing in, say, New York for the Mets or for the Yankees or for the Dodgers. They may probably get a little more play than it does playing for the Tigers. And so, I mean, that, that's, that's a great number, 500 RBI in that short period of time, and and a perennial 300 hitter. He is strong across the board. Average power RBIs up the middle. Pass for Lander. Polanco scoops to second, and Kiaspo is out. Royals leave two more on base. They've stranded eight in five innings.
that's the only run of the game. Coors Light Freeze Camp brought to you by Frost Brewed Coors Light, the world's most refreshing beer. Really talking to Andy Van Slyke, who I believe has a very famous throw in Royals history, not playing for the Royals, obviously. <laughs> But I believe it was his throw from right field to Daryl Porter that wasn't quite in time when Jim Sundberg maybe had the most famous slide in Royals history. Game six. Andy Van Slyke really was a character when he played and still two of my favorite lines from a player from Andy Van Slyke. First of all he was really struggling at the plate and remember the movie that came out with Jessica Tandy and Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman with Jessica Tandy's Driving driver. Uh -huh. Andy Van Slyke once says during that time the way I'm going right now I couldn't drive home Miss Daisy. <laughs> <laughs> that is trouble down in the right field corner. Well, the Tigers have a runner at second base with nobody out in a one to nothing game. So Guillen with his seventh double. The other line, and I have to ask him if he actually said this, but. Baseball players are famous for being very superstitious. Now, players will say, well, it's just my routine. Others will say it's superstition. And when interviewed about that as a player, Andy Van Slyke said, I don't believe in superstitions. I think they're bad luck. Cabrera was taking a shot towards right field with the runner at second and nobody out and he has that ability to not only move the runner by going to the opposite field but being such a good hitter he might hit the ball to right field and hit it off the wall. Well he's got that kind of power you're right Ryan he's a good he's a good two strike hitter and, and he knows what's needed in this situation. I mean he could easily go up there and just try to go for the long ball right from the start but he, he's trying to play the game. Kyle Farnsworth warming up behind Tejeda. Robinson at 85 pitches. He went 83 on Friday. Trey Hillman was asked before the game tonight, what kind of a leash does he have on Tejeda? And Trey said there is no particular pitch count. He's just going to judge by Tejeda's effectiveness. But he's in that area now where he's only making his second start. He has surpassed what he did his last time out. And it would be a stretch to say he is starting to show any kind of a strain by pitching into the mid 80s as far as his pitch count, but that could certainly happen because he hasn't been conditioned to do this all year. John Buck keeping Guillen at second base. Yeah, I think you're right, Ryan. I think what he. Well, they, a lot of times what they look at is it, it, you always have this imaginary number in your head, you, even though you may not say it, and that's what he did the last time out. And once he gets close to what he did the last time out, now you look at how effective he is going into that pitch count. If he's struggling going into that count, now you might want to think about getting him out. If he breezes through it, now you might want to take him another inning and then get him out. But, but you just don't have to remember that he, he's not a starter yet. Still one ball, two strikes. Last year in his first year in the American League, Miguel Cabrera led the league in home runs. So, so much for the adjustment period moving to a new league with new ballparks, new pitchers. He's come close to winning a batting title. He finished second to 
Freddy Sanchez in the National League in 2006. And he's fouled off five pitches in his plate appearance. He gets it to the right side. Long run for Kiaspo and throws him out. But that's a pretty unselfish at bat for a very accomplished hitter just getting Guillen over to third base. He battled all the way. I mean, he fouled off some tough pitches to get this job done. And this is a good pitch. And he really just reached his hands out there and hit the ball where he needed to hit it to get, get that job accomplished. And he'll, he'll get more high fives going back in the dugout for giving himself up. Than possibly getting a base hit because everybody knows that's what the situation called for. You and I have discussed this before, but when Lamar Johnson was batting coach for the Royals, he used to talk so often about the first two strikes for a hitter, and in particular, a good hitter who can drive in runs. The first two strikes are yours, the third strike is the team strike. And Cabrera looked like he had some swings there. He was trying to drive the ball, but when he had two strikes on him, now he turned his attention to just getting the job done and he did it. He did just what uh, what, the, what the game called for and uh, and I think that manager Jim Leland appreciates that and and his teammates and Berlin definitely appreciates it because you get a, uh, the tie and run 90 feet from home plate. So Bob McClure out there to talk about what they want to do with Aubrey Huff. Farnsworth is ready in the bullpen. And the Royals are going to play this with the infield at several different depths. Gordon is in. Betancourt a little more than halfway. Kiaspo a little deeper than halfway on the right side. And Butler even with the bag. Well, you know for sure your corner guys are going to look home first. And you got to decide whether the Tigers have the go on contact play on. Uh, Kiaspo's a little deeper because Huss' ability to pull the ball. You, you, so you got to try to get it out somewhere if you don't get the out at home plate. It's 2 and 0 on Huff. Struck out in the second, flied out in the fourth. So this is one of those defense alignments that doesn't come out of the book. This is a custom design defense. It's custom design and a lot of it's going to be the, the runner at third. What kind of speed does he have and whether or not manager Jim Leland's going to let him go on contact. Alex to the railing. Two balls, one strike. Robinson Tejeda has pitched 18 consecutive scoreless innings. That's his two starts combined. And his last few outings since moving from the bullpen to the rotation as a starter. He is equal tonight. What he did against the Angels on Friday, five and a third with no runs. And Huff to Kiaspo. So the custom made defense was perfect. Kiaspo didn't have to move. And that's the one reason that he was a little deeper than everyone else is because Huff does pull the ball a lot. And uh, Trey Hillman wanted to give him ch himself a chance to at least get an out by, play 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 by playing him a little deeper. And he was just fortunate enough to get a line drive. So he accomplished both uh, both situations with the same with that setup that he had on the field with the with the defense. So now the defense can relax and move back. And it's 0 1 to Cleet Thomas. Thomas doubled his last time up. The hate has struck him out in the second. Still throwing 95. One ball, one strike.
One and two. So one strike away from getting out of this. Guillen opened the inning with a double. Cabrera got him to third with one out. But now the tying run still at third with two away. And Tejeda escapes the sixth inning. And he does it with a 98 mile an hour fastball. Still 1 0 Royals. Take a one to nothing lead into the bottom of the sixth inning, and Robbins and Tejeda get a lot of high fives for a great outing tonight. And this is our Sonic Slam inning. Contestant is Mary Weiss Cole from Gladstone, Missouri. If the Raws hit a home run this inning, Mary will win $1,200. But if Raws hit a grand slam out of the park, Mary will win twenty-five grand from Sonic and the Kansas City Royals. Robbins and Tejeda telling Zach Rinky, "Well, what do you think about that?" Cy Young candidate and the Royals were thrilled with what they got from Tejeda on Friday against the Angels and they get even more tonight as he goes six scoreless innings and that gives him 19 consecutive scoreless going back to his last few appearances out of the bullpen what a turnaround <laughs> well before his start on Friday and then immediately after the start he becomes a candidate perhaps for the rotation next year. But after what he's done tonight, I don't know how he isn't a candidate. <laughs> he's got to be on the radar. I know he's on Bob McClure's radar. <laughs> he's, he's talked about him uh, before. And uh, there have been a couple other people who who's thrown his name around. And, and you know, going back to when you called him a, a middle game closer, when Trey was using him to bridge that gap in the, in the fourth, fifth, fifth, sixth, and get to the back of the order, he did a good job in multiple innings. And, then he went from two innings to three innings, and he sort of slowly been stretched out all along. But the only time he got a little out of whack was when Sawyer was just was hurt, and the bullpen just got turned over a little bit. But now that he's back in that role again, his last bullpen outing was uh, three innings, and and goes right into two consecutive good starts. Oh, and one to Alex, who has walked and popped out in his first game back from Triple A. Well, if the rotation stays the same, Tejeda should pitch again against the Tigers. The Royals have a day game tomorrow and then a three game series in Cleveland, and then they'll go back to Detroit. And that'll be a test for him because it's so difficult for a pitcher to pitch well against the same team twice within one week. And the Tigers will have a better idea of what he's throwing, how his pitches are moving. And Verlander 
Carter gets Alex looking, so that's eight strikeouts for Verlander to match Robinson Tejeda. Coming up on the next homestand, Saturday, September the 26th, 20,000 fans will take home the George Brett Replica Hall of Fame figurine. That'll be the Royals and the Minnesota Twins at 610. The gates will open at 4. So come on out, catch some batting practice, check out the brand new outfield experience. Betancourt is out, and Verlander has a 7 pitch, bottom of the 6. Royals still lead 1 0. AT&T, the nation's fastest 3G network. AT&T, your world delivered. One to nothing Royals to the seventh inning and 98 pitches for Robinson Tejeda. So he is out after six. So he adds 15 pitches to his pitch count. And that means the Royals are going to have to hold the lead and get nine outs. And Kyle Farnsworth is the first out of the bullpen. They'll get the lower third of the order. Brandon Inge, Gerald Laird, and Ramon Santiago. Ball one to Brandon Inge. So this is an almost identical situation for Tejeda tonight as it was Friday. He is out either in or after the sixth inning with a one nothing lead. In the game on Friday, the Angels got two runs in the eighth inning and won the game two to one. Inge isn't going to complain about Tejeda being out. He struck out twice against Tejeda, who had eight. And he went too far there. It's two and one. Well, Cal Farnsworth has made some adjustments early in the year. He was just strictly fastball slider. Now he's. He's added a little bit about a 91 mile an hour cutter to his repertoire, but it would really help him if he had uh, something a little slower, like a slow curveball or change up to really throw the hitters off balance. But when every, every pitch comes in there uh, hard, then chances are that the hitters are going to put that in play. Two and one on Brandon Inch. Since coming back from the disabled list and Farnsworth going down in June with a groin injury, he has pitched a total of six in a third innings with an ERA of about 9.5.
three balls, two strikes. Gordon backs up for a big hop and now a long throw and Butler with a backhand swipe for the out. Alex gives a little ground on this ball. He really gets behind it, Ryan, but the Billy does a great job saving him an error right there with that with that pick. That was on the backhand side. And that's a long throw. And Billy makes it look easy. So what a way, and now Gerald Laird, who struck out and walked against Tejeda. Laird now 0 for his last 15. Well, Alex could have opted to come in and take that ball on the shorter hop, but he gave when you give ground at third that deep, then you know that throw is going to have to have a lot on it to get across the diamond. The guy that runs pretty decent. Fooled by the slider, and it's one and one. All mixed up against Farnsworth. Didn't read the slider on the previous pitch and then tied up on a fastball down and in. Laird is 0 for 3 in previous at bats against Farnsworth. And Farnsworth's fastball usually doesn't react that way. Normally it's just straight, so it tells me that he's probably throwing a two seamer just trying to get a little bit more movement. Two up, two down against Farnsworth. And Farnsworth and Tejeda have combined to strike out nine in less than seven innings. And after that pitch down and in, this pitch is virtually unhittable. This is right on the outside corner, you know, thigh high, just a pitcher's pitch all the way. Santiago up the middle, but that's where Kiaspo is playing, and Farnsworth. With an easy seventh inning stretch time at Kauffman Stadium still one to nothing Royals. One nothing to the bottom of the seventh inning. Let's check other scores from around the American League. Brought to you by Panera Bread. Texas wins again after sweeping a doubleheader against Cleveland yesterday. New York over Tampa Bay, where Derek Jeter has tied Lou Gehrig for most hits and Yankee history. Minnesota over Toronto. So I'm sure the Tigers are aware of that. They're hoping the Royals hang on. Boston in front of Baltimore. 
trying to stay nine games back of the Yankees, although they have their sights set on the wild card. And right now, game and a half lead over Texas, with Texas already winning tonight. Bobby C takes over in the seventh. He took the loss, giving up two runs and two thirds of an inning. And the Royals with some lefties coming up to Jesus Meyer and the right hand hitting Billy Butler and after that Mike Jacobs. 0 oh and 2 on to Jesus who's trying to extend his hitting streak to 10 games. So that's what's happening in the American League. Royals also have three minor league affiliates that are in the playoffs. Did that get to Jesus? Apparently it did not. It sounded like it hit some. Another fancy two-step to get out of the way of this one. Might have hit the steel toe of the umpire. That's boot. what it was. You know, it had to be a steel toe. He didn't. He didn't move at all. <laughs> Regular shoes. He'd have been jumping up and down on that one. David singled and scored last night against Bobby C in that two-run seven. And pulls it to Polanco. So David is 0 for 4 so far. One out. And speaking of those minor league affiliates with a scoreboard update, here's Joel. Well, good news for all three of the playoff bound Royals minor league affiliates where they start the playoffs tonight. Northwest Arkansas in the ninth inning now, actually winning six to nothing. Wilmington has beat Lynchburg in the first game of that Carolina League series. Mike Mustock is two for four. Derek Robinson two for five. And Burlington late in that game beating Kane County in the Midwest League 12 to seven, guys. Ball one inside on Mitch Meyer. There's Mike Jersley, who just completed his seventh season as manager at Triple A Omaha. And for the last several years, when their season has concluded, he's come up to help out the big league team. So the rosters are now complete <laughs> as far as those joining the Royals for the month of September. Jersley has been in the Royals organization for a long, long time. Yeah, Mike and I both started in 92, Ryan. I, was, I started managing the uh, Boston Red Sox rookie league, and he's, he, he was down there with the Royals. We were both down in Baseball City. He was at Baseball City. I was at Winter Haven. Mike finished his playing career with the Royals in 1988. In the minor league system. Two and two on Meyer. So the Royals getting into the Tiger bullpen in the seventh inning. And even though Justin Verlander gave up only one run in six innings, they really made him work. He threw 112 pitches in those six innings. Still two and two on Meyer. No Royals fans, StubHub.com is the official fan-to-fan -fan ticket marketplace of the Kansas City Royals. And you can see just how easy it is to score great seats to any game. At StubHub.com. You can even get tickets to a little mini golf in the outfield experience. Still two and two on Mitch Meyer. With the September call ups and arrested bullpen, Jim Leland last night used five relievers. And the Tigers, who had 
a five to two lead at one point and then five to four into the later innings the Tigers suffering a blown save it was their 21st of the year at Nick Myers Jersey so after all those foul balls he's down to first with one out 21 blown saves is the second most in the American League the Seattle Mariners have 22 but sometimes those saves come in the seventh inning or the eighth inning Fernando Rodney has what only one or two blown saves and talking to some of the Tiger broadcasters before the game tonight they were surprised to hear that they had the second most blown saves in the American League because they've been very happy with their bullpen this year. I know they got they're happy with the power arms coming out of there good mix of lefty righty but you know those kind of things have a tendency to sneak up on you because the team's in first place and you don't pay as much attention to them. That only tells you just how much further they could be out in front had they not had so many blown saves. Fernando Rodney by the way has one blown save. Fernando Rodney making some news this week about how he celebrated a converted save on Friday in Tampa Bay. That was a game that Justin Verlander pitched. Verlander gave up one run in eight innings. Rodney pitching the ninth and it was a long battle over 30 pitches and when he got the final out he just heaved the ball towards the upper deck behind home plate. And the ball ended up going into the press box. And because of that, the league suspended him three games. A suspension he plans on appealing. So Fernando Rodney is available in this series. And just watching that replay, it's pretty clear that he wasn't necessarily aiming at anyone, just out of frustration. That's all out of frustration and uh, it takes me back to Darnell Coles playing third base for the Tigers when Sparky Anderson was managing. He was having a tough time and and they got a ground ball made an error and, and then he just took the ball and threw it out of Tiger Stadium. <laughs> you know, needless to say Sparky took him out of the game. But. In the deep left center the Royals are going to add a run. And Billy Butler is going to add a double. Two to nothing Royals in the bottom of the seventh. Get to Bobby C again. And again, Ryan, it's Billy Butler right in the middle of things, uh, getting the big hits and getting the runs around. And it's a fastball right down the middle of the plate. And, and Billy did a good job just staying right on it and, and driving the ball. And with Mitch on first base, there's no way he's not going to score on the ball if it goes to the wall here in, in left or right center field. Oh, he pointed it out. That when the inning began, there were a lot of left hand batters coming up, but Billy Butler was the one right hand batter in there. And now Mike Jacobs is going to be replaced by Brian Pena, switch hitter who can move over to the right side of the plate. Jacobs driving in the first run for the Royals back in the third inning, scoring Billy Butler. Brian started behind the plate last night and had an RBI double. That was the third straight game that Brian Pena was the Royals catcher. He grounds it to the right side. Polanco throws him out. And Butler moves up to third base. Not only do the Royals score again against Bobby C, and they do it again in the seventh inning. A familiar culprit doing Bobby C in hitting Mitch Meyer. He hit Mitch Meyer last night and Meyer came around to score. Last night's game, Meyer coming around and scoring the go ahead run. But the Royals in front 6 5. They won 7 5. Tonight coming around to score to make it a 2 0 game. And Alberto Cayaspo, who hits so well from the right side of the plate. 
Tigers aren't going to mess with him and they're going to set up a lefty lefty with Bobby C and Mark Tian. Talked to Jim Leland before the game. They talked about intentional walks, and they, 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 they really looked at intentional walks as as being if if it was practiced more in the minor leagues before the guys get up here, they would be more familiar with that situation. But he feels like if to manage in the big leagues, you, you should be, feel pretty comfortable about walking a guy and knowing that your pitch is going to get you out of the jam for the guy you see walking in the pitch to. And he just felt like when he was managing the minor leagues. He would create those situations on purpose so that his pitchers would have to pitch out of those situations. So they, he said that it's still a struggle, but they still have to see it before they get here. Oh, and one to Mark Tian. He did not see Bobby C last night. He faced Fu Taini in the Royals' two run seventh inning. But against Bobby C, you ask. Tian just two out of 13. That's 154. Down to the count, no balls, two strikes. Tonight, Tian has walked and grounded out twice. And two right handers warming up, so if Tian gets on and John Buck comes to the plate. Probably going to be the end of the line for Bobby C. Struck him out. Royals at a run. Billy Butler with his second double tonight. And in the seventh, driving in Mitch Meyer. One hundred and twelve pitches and the Royals getting RBIs from Mike Jacobs in the third inning Billy Butler in the seventh Butler has two doubles tonight. Josh Anderson takes over. In center field. And Mitch Meyer moves over to right so Mark Teen is out following his strikeout against. Bobby C in the bottom of the seventh inning. And Kyle Farnsworth, who set down the Tigers in order in the seven, stays on for the eighth, and he'll get the top of the order. Oh, and one on Granderson.
Anderson 0 for 3. All those plate appearances against Tejeda. This is a long, long run for DeJesus and Betancourt and David into a slide. He may have started a little too soon. And he kind of plugged on the wet grass. He's got a little smile on his face, Ryan. I think he did. He did, he did come up a little short. I think the biggest thing he wanted to go into a slide, but some kind of way his legs got even, and he ended up on his knees, and it really threw him forward. But he probably, he probably was looking to go into just a regular slide, and and then and where he could cover some ground. But I don't know how his, I don't know how his legs got got in that position. Right there. That's probably why he came up laughing. <laughs> what is that? I don't think he knows either. <laughs> Granderson strikes out. So four up against Farnsworth, four back to the dugout. And now Placido Polanco, who's 0 for 3. Farnsworth may have just injured himself. Either that or he just hated the fact that he threw that pitch where he threw it. <laughs> he gave every indication that something wasn't quite right. That unless he just, just wasn't totally happy with the location. A couple of outings ago, he came out early because of a stiff back. Well, that sure looked a lot more than just being frustrated with a pitch. Trey Hillman walking up the steps in the Royals dugout as they're watching Farnsworth carefully. Two and two on Polanco. Farnsworth is really bothered by it appears the dirt on the mound. He's really working that grinder pad on the back of the mound to try and get the clay off of his spikes. He's still throwing 99 with his fastball. We've seen some heat in here tonight. I'm telling you, this is a fastball. This is this is good run. I mean, this is something we haven't seen from Farnsworth. Is the running of the fastball normally is a straight fastball hard slider. He's throwing throwing two seamers that are running in and, and, and got a little cutter working for himself. So a little bit more moving on his pitches and it show, and, and, and shows that he's being real effective with it. Right to Kiaspo. Bill Farnsworth has retired five in a row. Two outs in the eighth inning. Yeah, Trey looked like he was on his way to the mound. So maybe he sees what we saw. And he's really keeping a close eye on Farnsworth. I don't think Farnsworth realizes it. So a pitcher, a power pitcher who spent a long time on the disabled list this year with a groin injury and now a back that stiffened up. Couple of outings ago. And he's still throwing 99 with a fastball, and it's 0 and 1 on Guillen. I think right now there's no way he's going to come out of this ball game. Now he, he's been real effective, and he's missed some time. So, yeah, I think, I think he's a tough guy. You know, he wants to go out there and prove that he can he can be healthy and pitch well. And right now he's, he's got a good role going, and I don't think he wants to wants to get out of there. Trying to hold it for Tejeda, who went six tonight, and trying to get it to Soria. Two and 
two and one. Guillen in his last at bat double that was leading off the sixth inning. In a one nothing game. Miguel Cabrera's ground ball got him to third but. Neither Huff nor Thomas could get him home. Again to Kiaspo. So two scoreless innings for Farnsworth. And the Royals coming up in the bottom of the eighth ahead 2 0. Six from Robinson to Heda. The final results in tonight's you call it presented by Sprint, the best young fan face this year. There's that guy who didn't get the foul ball. There's the kid who lost his carrot and was just devastated by that development. And then the president of the Mark T and fan club. And it's the carrot kid with four percentage points in front of the Tian fan. Thank you for participating. We kind of came up with that one in the middle of the game last night. Fernando Rodney, who is 32 out of 33 in save opportunities, on in a non save situation, will get John Buck, Alex Gordon, and Unieski Betancourt. Royals getting their first run against Justin Verlander in the third inning. Mike Jacobs singles scored Billy Butler with two outs. And then in the seventh inning against Bobby C. Billy Butler's double got Mitch Meyer to the plate. One and one to John Buck who was one for three against Verlander. Backing up to the grass, and Buck is the first out of the eighth inning. The Kansas City Royals, the state of Missouri, and Fox Sports Kansas City have joined together to encourage young people not to smoke because once you start, it's hard to stop. Strike out tobacco so we can all breathe. Call the Missouri Tobacco Quit Line at 1 800 Quit Now. Alex Gordon has walked and he's 0 for 2. And there's the Fernando Rodney changeup. And a 
fastball at 99. Man, Joaquin Soria getting ready for the top of the ninth inning. And he'll get Cabrera, Huff, and Thomas. And Alex to the opposite field. The end trying to cut it off deep. He does. But Alex in head first with a one out double. Alex picks on a fastball out over the plate, stays with it, and that's what uh, Kevin Sicer wants him to try to do is just try to stay in that direction. Don't try to pull a ball. Use your strength in that area. It's working with Mike Jacobs, and here you see it, it, Alex Gordon has a lot of success when he does that. Yunievsky Betancourt, one for three with a single tonight. Now, I, mean, I know we talk a lot about uh, hitters going the other way, standing in the center, and just just an explanation of why you want hitters to try to drive the ball to left-handers over shortstops, the right-handers over second base, is that when you do get that ball inside, you more have to keep that ball fair rather than looking to pull it right away and it's foul right off the bat. And that's 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 part of Kevin's philosophy. Is like I don't want to take your power away, but I just want you to focus out in here and react to the ball inside and, and, and try to keep that ball fair. And don't you wait a little longer too when you're thinking the opposite field? Definitely, you wait longer because you, you the ball is going to be out away from you, so you got to let it get a little deeper so you can hit it that way. And it's those fractions of a second, microseconds, that sometimes separate the good hitters from the mediocre ones, where the mediocre ones will make a decision too soon. And the better hitters will lay off certain pitches because they can wait a little longer. Well, they trust their hands a lot better, too. And they don't get a lot of body into it. They're not trying to muscle a swing through the zone. Well, David DeJesus is going to get another shot to extend his hitting streak as Fernando Rodney has allowed two runners with one out. David has hit in nine in a row, but tonight he is 0 for 4. Alex Gordon with a one out double. Betancourt follows the walk. One for 11 against Fernando Rodney, but he's only struck out once. So you wonder how many of those balls were well hit, but right in one of the Tiger defenders. Two and oh. And out comes pitching coach Rick Knapp. Well, if you're looking for someone to pull for, Rick Knapp could certainly be one of those guys. This is his first year as Tigers pitching coach. And that was after 26 years in the minor leagues as a coach. A 41st round pick of the Texas Rangers. Did not get to the big leagues as a pitcher. And then 26 years as a coach, finally in the big leagues. And it's 3 0 into Jesus. Full count. Yeah. 
up the middle, and David has a 10-game hitting streak, and the Royals have a 3 to nothing lead. So Alex Gordon coming around to score, and if the Royals could add another run, we might see Jamie Wright in the ninth inning instead of Joaquin Soria. Well, it seems like you see the same old faces doing the same old things. Uh, you see Butler, now you see uh, David DeZeus back through the middle, hit this ball firm. Blanco Dove, but just wasn't able to get this ball hit really well. And Alex Gordon kind of cruise home on this base hit. So Benton Courts at third base. And to Jesus at first. And a squeeze, and Meyer gets the job done. Royals have a four to nothing lead. Can't ask for a better bunt than that. He just hit it right on the end of the bat and dead this ball right out in the green patch there. And uh, that was that was perfect. Such a good bunt. He almost ended up with a base hit on it. So Rodney gives up two, and the Royals lead four nothing. Bunt to get Unieski Betancourt to the plate earlier in the inning. David De Jesus extending a hitting streak to 10 games, driving in Alex Gordon. De Jesus at second base, and the Royals will get their first look at Casey Fien, a September call up who has appeared in four games, drafted by the Tigers in 2006 in the 20th round at a Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. And Fiend will get Billy Butler, who has doubled twice tonight. He has scored a run, he has driven in a run. So Billy is up to 44 doubles. Third most in the American League. One and one.
Deep center field. Granderson won't get it. Another extra base hit for Butler. And the Royals have a 5 to nothing lead. A three-double game for Billy Butler. Fastball up out over the plate, Ryan. And Billy does a good job getting on top of it. I tell you, he just got good leverage working for him right now. And he's he just getting his pitch and he's squaring the ball up. He's not missing his pitch. And when he's in this kind of a groove, we've seen this before. He, he can do this for quite a while. That's a Royals record, by the way. Billy becomes the first player in Royals history to have four separate three double games. When he had his third three double game, that was a Royals record. Pena hits it hard to Polanco. The Royals with five runs, ten hits in a game that was started by Justin Verlander. A five nothing lead in the ninth inning. American League. So five to nothing Royals to the ninth inning after the game. Boulevard Royals live. Joel Goldberg with interviews from the field, reaction from the clubhouse, and analysis with Joel and Split from Rival Sports Bar out in right field. Brought to you by Boulevard Brewing Company, Kansas City's beer. So it's Jamie Wright instead of Joaquin Sori in the ninth inning in a five-run game. Miguel Cabrera, Aubrey Huff, and Cleet Thomas coming up against Wright. Well, Ryan, we can't say enough about how Billy's been swinging the bat of late. And he's 12 for 25 in his last six games, and and he's really been uh, driving the ball to all areas of the field, which which, which just really see, tells, me, tells me that he's really seeing the ball well. We've seen him drive the ball to right field corner, left field corner, 440. We won't forget that one. Uh, but uh, but the three three double game tonight, just uh, he just squaring the ball up, not missing this pitch. Well, nobody in Royals history had ever had three separate three double games in one year. Billy now has four. The team record is 54 doubles by Hal McRae. And Billy is nine shy of that. And the Royals will have 22 games after tonight. 23 games.
Three balls, two strikes. Three and two. Six scoreless innings for Robinson Tejeda. And then two from Kyle Farnsworth. The Tigers with only three hits in their first eight at bats. And that's a leadoff walk. Came very close to hitting Miguel Cabrera. Uh, Joaquin Soria was going to pitch the ninth inning if it was a three to nothing game or less. And that would mean that Joaquin would appear in three straight games going back to closing out the final game of the Angels series and last night and tonight. So you get Jamie Wright in there. And then Joaquin would be available tomorrow. Most likely would not be available tomorrow if he pitched tonight. But now you have to make sure that Jamie Wright finishes off this inning and you don't have to bring in Soria to get the save anyway. Well, you don't want to see that first walk when they come out of the bullpen. That kind of gets everybody on the edge of their seats. Aubrey Huff is 0 for 3. Two and one. And now Bob McClure is going to go out and talk to Jamie Wright. And the phone rings out in the Royals bullpen. Jamie Wright is a big dude and you can see how when you're that big and as Trey Hillman likes to say to borrow one of his terms he has some funk to his delivery which adds to his deception and the sink that he gets he's six foot five you could see how a few things could go wrong and from time to time Jamie Wright could lose his mechanics. Well he can right and just try to overthrow is usually the, the, the number one thing. And just coming out and just trying to pitch. That got a piece of Betancourt's glove. And the Tigers have two on with nobody out. A lot of times you come out and just try to be a little too fine, try to pitch to the corners right away. Well, sometimes it's better just come out and go right at him with a five run lead, just go right at him and let him hit the ball and, and let him try to get themselves out. Now whether Soria comes in or not he is warming up again and warming up it looks like to come into the game so you wonder even if he comes out of the bullpen does this make him unavailable for tomorrow. Well if he gets up more than one time I think and depends on how many pitches he throw it you yeah, definitely have to think about it they've got a Rosa up throwing with him so I'm not sure exactly uh, which way Matthew Trey Hillman wants to go here but uh, but Soria is definitely up twice and that that's a lot of pitches. That base hit for Aubrey Huff is only the fourth hit for the Tigers tonight. One and one to Cleet Thomas, who has one of the four hits. Doubled back in the fourth inning. Got the call. Well, may have gotten a little help from home plate umpire Marty Foster. <laughs> Strike.
struck him out. So one down in the ninth. And for the Royals tonight, that's 11 strikeouts. Tonight's copyrighted telecast is presented by the authority of the Kansas City Royals and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form. And the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without the express written consent of the Kansas City Royals Baseball Corporation. Ball one on Brandon Inge. Two strikeouts against Tejeda and grounded out against Farnsworth. Shallow center and Josh Anderson almost made a diving catch. I think he may have hesitated for a moment before coming in. Off of his glove for a single and the bases are loaded with one out. Yeah, that's kind of a risky play there, right? You got two men on and you, you kind of get caught in between whether you're going to dive or whether you're going to try to run through this ball. If he dives, this ball gets by. Then it's a bigger problem for for the Rawls, but he's able to to come in and, and keep this ball in front of him. It's really just hit off the heel of his glove. It's a very catchable ball. Mm -hmm. so the Royals will use Joaquin Soria. With the bases loaded, one out in the ninth. Up a pinch hitter and rookie catcher Alex Avila. Avila pinch hit in the eighth inning last night. Flight out to left field against Roman Colon. Avila's faced Soria once and he walked. And this inning began with a walk. Jamie Wright walking Miguel Cabrera. Aubrey Huff singled off of Unieski Betancourt's glove. And then after a strikeout of Cleet Thomas, Brandon Inge singled off the glove of Josh Anderson in center field. One ball, one strike. So Soria going for his 24 save and a save in three consecutive games. Struck out the side on. Monday against the Angels and struck out the side last night against the Tigers. There were some base runners, but all outs coming by way of the strikeout. And it's two and one on Avila.
three and one. Now Vila hasn't been up very long. He's only had 44 at bats. But still he has not grounded into a double play. Three and two. The potential tying run is on deck. And that'll be another pinch hitter and a big bat in Marcus Timms. Yeah, this, this is a big hitter for Joaquin Sawyer here. This, this what Avila does right here will dictate how this inning goes. If he gets him out, he's got a chance to get out of it. But if he gets a base hit here, it just adds to the problem. Tigers know that Minnesota has already won tonight. So a loss to the Royals would put the Twins five and a half back. White Sox are tied with Oakland in extra innings. Almost hit the runner at third Cabrera. Avila was drafted last year. So this is not a guy who's been in the organization for a while. He was not only was he drafted last year, but not the kind of guy you figure would get to the big league so quickly. He was taken in the fifth round. And he is hanging in there against Soria. His father is a longtime assistant general manager of the Tigers. Al Avila and Al Avila when he's at the ballpark at Comerica Park doesn't say a whole lot doesn't have a lot of expression on his face but it's sure very hard to contain himself when his son is at the plate into left field Cabrera will be tagging and De Jesus will play it to third base so the shutout Comes to an end. It's five to one. But with that out, and Marcus Temps coming to the plate, the tying run remains in the on deck circle. That run is charged to Jamie Wright. So Marcus Temps, who started in left field, in last night's game and had two RBIs with a single and a sacrifice fly. And a slider for strike one. He did a game try and was moving along pretty good and all of a sudden he hit a roadblock here in the ninth inning and, and everybody's on the edge of their seats and even though you may win this game you, you always feel like you might have lost this game <laughs> at the same time. Deep center and Anderson makes the catch. So the Royals survive a scare in the ninth inning but Joaquin Soria closes it out. And the Royals have won three consecutive games for the first time. And over two months, it was July 4th, 5th, and 6th when the Royals beat the White Sox twice and the Tigers once. And the Royals have won a home series 